because even at the museum show, was that an air raid siren that you guys brought up? That was the, that was the uh, air raid siren that was from the very old, the, the, the mothball Brisbane uh, fire department. Oh, wow. yeah. And then the other thing were, were uh, those were warning horns that you would typically find in a uh, flour mill. Because in a flour mill, it's verboten to uh, have uh, electrical sparks. And so everything, like the warning sirens, are all air pneumatic. But there's three of them simultaneously going on, and they're uh, they're 10 inch diaphragm, so that's five kilowatt each. Yeah. It's like 10 by 10 or 12 kilowatts of noise, <laughs> which is pretty loud for a horn. Yeah, I was curious about the sound at these shows. Sound can be kind well. Of came a, came as a second thing. Is that did it come along sort of incidentally as you well, started the Bill SRL shows, or is it something? Well, it's, the, the, it's, those like surprising things and things like like really intense sound fields yeah. and stuff like that, uh, and like the explosives. We use we have used a lot of explosives in our show. I'm not going to get into that these days, you know. But uh, but uh, you know, basically, you know, since the focus of the organization and and the shows has always been a sort of a theatrical nature which means they happen in real time and you have to get you don't want to have people come to something a show and say well that was like a nice exhibition of sculptures and they'll talk about like the aesthetics of like the big arm you want to come to a show and said that was a show like there was like a interact these machines I was in a living world of machines yeah. you know for an hour you know I felt like I was there it was their world and I was watching it it wasn't my world right, right. it's a, it's another place and so <clears throat> That's uh, there's a problem you run into when you do that, and the problem is that the machines, unlike human actors, well, some human actors have like a much more narrow range. There's not that many things they can do. There's only like a certain amount of uh, you can do to cover that up and to make them look more versatile. Uh, you know, we characterize them. They're built in kind of an organic way. They have that look that they might be, you know, kind of. That living look a little bit, you know. There's a there's a process to the way that they're made that makes them more personable characters. But there's a limit to how far you can go with that. And so, you know, it's sort of like the glue that holds. You know, you you would think it's kind of disruptive, but actually, what it does, it it actually is a cohesive uh, factor. You know, all that noise and all that chaos of sound and, uh, and the explosions and the fire, the things that kind of uh, cause more of a primal reaction. What, what happens is when, you're ex when humans are exposed to that, and it's very well documented, things happen to you. you your adrenaline levels go up, your IQ drops a little bit. <laughs> so your ability to like analyze what's going on is reduced to some extent. Your reactions to things are more emotional. This is... Uh, this is like a very, the military studied this extensively because they want to know what happens when people get shell-shocked. And so they're, you know, they, there's a, all these studies, which I have, you know, I collected them years and years ago, <coughs> that point to the fact that uh, those kind of events that like really deal with people's primal fears, like fire, sound, uh, things that happen suddenly, they're, uh, what they do is they, they keep the show as a theatrical event. They hold it together as a continuous event as opposed to a discrete kind of sculptural exhibit. Mm -hmm. And they fill in the gaps between action. Because, you know, even though there's a, we, you try to make as much simultaneous action as you can, you try to take advantage of whatever is going on and you, you, you choreograph things to the extent that you can. You know, but you're always looking for an advantage. And a lot of it's like, you know, we, we've got some amazing people running these machines that are like so, <coughs> they're so skilled, I mean it's, you know, it's a lot of it's the skill of the operators uh, running them, but, uh, you know, and, and also the fact that we're all just really tired, you know, so there's, there's that fact too, the people operating the machines are sort of running right the edge of fatigue, so you're not, you're just sort of, you're operating in a very intuitive way because that's the only way you have left to operate, and so, uh, that's a factor, but the, all that intensity of sound is, is an important factor to, into making these shows uh, what they are. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that's why, and and I, I re, you know all each one of these shows you learn a little bit more about how to do the shows. I mean I don't know that it's applicable to anything else, but 
uh, it's certainly I try to understand like what happened in a show. I try to I try to decide like what worked, what didn't work, why it worked. I try to you know I, I, I question people. I uh, spend a lot of time looking at those videos and try to learn from each show and develop kind of a, expand the repertoire of what, what's possible. And just as you were talking, I was um, thinking about the kinds of inbuilt irony here that you're using uh, found materials from the war industry to make a comment about the destructive use of machinery. It seems it's part of your intention. Mm -hmm. But in the process of doing that, are you is, could your audience be harmed by all of those techniques? The well, loud sound and the shock and the fire? And not those kinds of things. I mean, we do pass out earplugs. We passed out, we had a few mm -hmm. thousand earplugs, yeah. you know, at the mm -hmm. ready. I mean, I can't, you know, I, 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 I'm not protected to the extent that I was holding people down and, you know, we didn't have the earplug insertion crew there or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at a certain at a certain point we you could have to you, know, you have to depend on people's uh, you know uh, people's self-interest in their survival. Mm -hmm. So you know there's a certain level of common sense we ask of an audience. I mean if you're in an area where something clearly is happening that's out of control you should move. And you know generally people do and there's never an issue with that but you know we we from the outside, it's, it's really hard to know like when something's really dangerous or not. And we try to we're we try to be very aware of it. And so like about how long do your shows last? Up to the uh, show with a like a large scale show with a hundred tons with, of machines. Like you just showed us. Uh, that show, mm -hmm. the show in Austria, those were about forty five minute long shows. The street show under the bridge in San Francisco. How long would that? Be? It was about forty five minutes to maybe fifty minutes. Yeah. That's about the maximum that they are, but you know, they, I mean, they go all the way from, you know, usually they're at night. But here's a nice SRL. Oh, oh, <laughs> and the museum tried to sue me after the show. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and we just did, you know, we did what we did. But anyway, so uh, this is a nice daytime show, which is a little different, different of an angle, a little more light, lighthearted, and stuff like that. But. Uh, but in this case, that V1 was like, I mean, it's one thing to have a V1 buzz bomb. A lot of it's context, right, of like how extreme it is. Like, it's one thing to have a V1 buzz bomb inside a toilet paper factory in, like, Austria or something. Like, you know, you kind of like Europe, right? You know, it's a festival. <laughs> you know, it's like not that out of the question something like that would happen. But to be able to do it in downtown San Francisco in the middle of a work day was not... And we were doing the backfires with it. This is about as loud as a stick of dynamite. What's and, that uh, that's coming that, up? That's a rail gun. The the flat the sparks. No, no, no. Behind, behind it, that. It's the air. Like oh. I think it's fabric. Fabric. Yeah. Uh, is it fabric? The, that's fabric. Yeah, it's a giant fabric on poles that wow. were, we were wiggling them around to make it look like it was really windy. Uh, so it was like a prop thing. Somebody mentioned a jet engine. Oh, I see. It looks like something. We have a bunch yeah, of jet engines. Yeah, it looks like something. 15 <laughs> jet engines. Yeah. Well, high, there's a high jet engine count at SRL. <laughs> because, you know, it's like, it's like, my, I, like my friend Greg Legs Lay said, you can never release too much energy in too short of a period of time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he always told me, so I always think of that. Uh, but, you know, the, again, the, the people really, like, thought it was, I think the V1 seemed a lot louder in the daytime, and certainly the effect was much more, uh, it had a lot, it had a different effect than it would have had at night in kind of one of these kind of weird, moody kind of show scenarios. So it, you have to it shut down the city for about 10 minutes in that part of town. You have to have permits to do this? We do. We always get permits for it. Uh, we get what's called a variance permit, typically. And a variance permit is a little known permit that you get when, uh, basically what happens is somebody up high <coughs> says they're going to take the responsibility for it. And so the fire and the police don't have to. <coughs> you have to get one of those in these bigger shows. Like in Los Angeles, we've done a number of large shows in Los Angeles recently. It's a very SRL friendly place. And the process there is that uh, we get someone from the museum 
and somebody from a couple of other places will write a letter to the Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors says, you know, they, they talk to the guy or the, whoever is the local supervisor for that district, and they just say, well, they're going to, this is this art thing here, and like, and then the, the, the Board of Supervisors issues an edict that says this is in the interest of the city to have this happen more than it's in the interest of the city to have <coughs> things like uh, that are, aren't permitted to, to avoid things like that are too out of control to happen. And so we are gonna, we, it's, we're gonna let it happen. And so they send that out to the fire department and the police department and the police department and the fire department go, great, it's not on our dime. Mm -hmm. And they know that if anything weird happens that it's gonna go back to the Board of Supervisors and the Board of Supervisors is, is the, you know, they're the power, so they get to do whatever they want to do, basically. What's going on here? And you go, well, we have a permit for this. And they go, you got a permit. Okay. Do they really know what you're going to do? I mean, we have a permit. We always have insurance for this. I mean, the insurance, and, and I've been insured so many times for these shows. I mean, when you get insurance for this, <clears throat> for the show out here, I had to send photos of all the machines we were using. I sent a map, a vertical map kind of thing that I made of the street, where the audience was going to be, how many people were going to be there, how long the show was going to last, and you have to send that into the insurance company. And they send it into like what TRW or AIG they used to, I guess. And the underwriters go, but but uh, we've been insured so many times. I mean, uh, that policy, which was a two million dollar policy for that show for the museum cost 350 bucks. Yeah. But that's the thing, it's like you get kind of grandfathered in. And so, you know, we do, we do, uh, you know, we get insurance, uh, uh, we get permits for these things. And, you know, it's, it's probably good that not everyone does stuff like this because, uh, you know, the odds are against you. At a certain point, something bad is going to happen. But, you know, I mean, any kind of intense thing, racing, car racing, you know, there's all kind, you know, it's, all that stuff is pretty dangerous. Uh, you know, and I mean, I'm 57 now, and uh, knock on wood, you know, we've, we've been pretty lucky so far, but... You know, it's, it, it's the, the danger thing is a constant concern. You have to really, you've got to really always be thinking about it. And because I was injured so badly working on a show, you know, I just like, you know, they talk about the hand in the Terminator. I just go, the hand, <laughs> stop. You know, I, all I have to do is hold that up and people, people take it seriously. They're like, oh, okay. Yeah, we could, this is very dangerous. And uh, the shows are, are, hazardous but what's even more dangerous is actually being in that shop and making those things that's dangerous I mean any of those machines could eat you up and spit you out and uh, the computer control ones move so fast you wouldn't even know what happened you know <clears throat> you'd be you, you know they'd be scraping you off the floor but that's you know again that's just part of the you know part of the the relentless pursuit of of uh, the technical you know, there's a lot of different, a lot of different angles to it. I mean, I, I would never recommend it to anybody, but, uh, but it is one way to sort of deal with a world where everything is getting increasingly technical and increasingly sort of multi-layered, where you know you're only seeing a little bit of it. I mean, there's like a huge movement of foot. You see Make Magazine. I mean, there's a huge movement of foot to kind of like take up the slack where like, you know, I mean, teenagers used to go like hot rod their cars in the 50s and 60s. I mean, you know, there was a gap between like, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s where you had a whole generation of kids that grow up that don't know how to like fix a toilet. Mm -hmm.